Well, welcome to it. Uh, the first of the Run Talk essay webinars, and this one titled Is Comrades for Me? I'm Brad Brown. With me this evening is Lindsay Parry. Lindsay, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Absolute pleasure, Brad. Entries have opened. Comrades' excitement is high. Um, perfect timing for us to get this uh, show on the road. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you say entries are open. I was looking on that Comrades website just a short while ago, and, and they're just short on, on 4,000 entries already. Entries have only been open for, for three days. Yeah, I know. It's incredible. Um, obviously, the degree of difficulty this year with the uh, heat and the wind hasn't uh, scared anyone off. In fact, it's made people more determined than ever to come and do something great. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be, last last year's one, or I say last year, this year's one was frightening. I can't see conditions being that bad two years in a row, but stranger things have happened. Uh, yeah, I just want to welcome everybody else on board who's who's watching this webinar, wherever you are. Thanks for, for joining us tonight. We want to try and make this thing as interactive as possible. So if you have got any questions, what you can do is if you're on Twitter, uh, you can just use the hashtag AskRTSA and uh, I'll get Lindsay to uh, answer those questions for you. You can also ask the questions on our Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com forward slash runtalksa, or if you'd like, you can pop us an email as well, uh, podcast at runtalksa. Just so you know as well, there is about a, a minute, minute and a half delay from us actually speaking to, to where, where you actually pick up the feed, so uh, we won't be able to answer those questions straight away. It does, does have a, a bit of a... Uh, a couple of minutes delay, so if you uh, yeah ask your questions, get them in now, and and then we'll start answering questions as soon as they start coming through. Lindsay, the first thing I wanted to ask you, comrades, is especially for the novices, and and I speak from experience. I mean, I did my first one four years ago in, in 2010, and it's daunting. I mean, 90 kilometers, the down runs 89 kilometers. It's it's a huge, huge thing, especially if, if someone's just plodding along now. Maybe they're doing the odd 5K, the odd 10K. Who can run comrades? And, and I ask that, that question seriously. Can anyone run the race? Look, almost, I'm a firm believer that most people can run. Let me not say almost everyone, um, because it is an enormous task. But I'm a real believer that most people, if they set their mind to it, they systematic in their approach, can get themselves to a point where they can run with plenty of walking at eight minutes and three seconds thereabouts per kilometer and they can get to the finish line in under 12 kilometers. Uh, but it does require discipline, it requires patience and it really requires a, a eight to 12 month commitment to the project. Yeah, that, uh... Uh, they're probably going to freak a lot of people out because it, it doesn't seem like that much and the race isn't that far away. Uh, I just had a, had a question come through. I was actually just looking on Twitter uh, from Marika Duplessis and she said, what base should you have starting starting comrades like before considering starting comrades? Can someone who's never run realistically sitting right now tonight, can they be on the start line on the 1st of June 2014? But they can, but those are your your highest risk for failure for a number of reasons. The, the first thing is, is that because they've got to be slow and systematic in their approach, it is possible that someone who hasn't done any exercise for a number of years um, may run out of time. And they're also your highest injury risk group. So the reality is that if they try and build too quickly towards the race, uh, they're also the people who tend to pick up the ITDs, the Achilles problems, the, the knee problems. So it is difficult for the group that are literally going from the couch to comrades. Um, we're in September now, uh, so they really want to get up and get going literally right now because they are running out of, out of time. Um, but for your kind of average person that keeps some kind of degree of fitness, whether it's formal or informal, someone who plays the odd game of hockey, uh, you know, just to stay in touch with the old friends, those kind of people, if they are, are patient and smart in their build-up, they should have no problem getting to the to the kind of mileage that's required to finish the comrades now. Okay, and, and Lindsay, you, you talk about the, the the sort of guys doing it from now. 
we've got a couple of people that are, are watching this webinar tonight that, that aren't out and out novices, but they did the uprun last year and are now looking at doing their first downrun. There's also quite a few novices with us tonight that, that this will be their first comrades. Will you explain to us the difference between the uprun and the downrun? Like, just how are they that different? Is it is it? I mean, can the training be pretty much the same, or, or are they they vastly vastly different? You have to approach them differently. The, the training can be quite similar if you are game going for a finish in the in the race. So if you're going for your back to back and you you were between ten and twelve hours, you can have a very similar type of training. But the reality is that the two races, although they are similar in distance, couldn't really be more different in the, the, the effect that they have on you during the race. So in order to perform well in the up and the down, it takes not very different training. There's some subtle differences. And in, in like a, a, a very simple summary, I summarize the two races in the uprun being the slow poison. Okay, it's, it's not nearly as high impact, but as the day progresses, and particularly the first 39 kilometers, your energy just gets drained from you. And what made this year so hard was that you first had that kind of drain of the first 39 k's with an enormous amount of climbing. And then when you got to the 50k mark, plus minus, where the, the uprun usually uh, is quite pleasant from there. In, in other words, the, the going gets easier. You can normally start eating up large chunks of tar and, and start to get into a really good um, headspace. This year it was so hot and the wind was howling. So the, the slow poison, so to speak, just kept going. And I think a lot of people fortify themselves to say, well, just get to Polly's because I've been to Lindsay Perry talks and he says that after Polly's it's seven kilometers and everybody who gets over Polly's finishes comrades. And then this year they got over Polly's and the wind was blowing even harder. So, <laughs> this year, so, so this year really highlighted that sort of slow poison as I, as I like. It's the down in pain management is High, high impact. Uh, the first, again, the first sort of 30 to 40 k's of the race is also up and then down. Uh, you'd be questioning yourself, am I actually doing a down comrades? But the climbs are not nearly as severe as on the up run. And then, of course, in the second half of the race, all those climbs that really suck your energy out on the up run, you now have to run down them. Pretty tired legs. And all that culminates in by the time you get to Pine Town, which is about 24 kilometers to go as you enter Pine Town, um, you are really, really starting to hurt. And it becomes a question of those that can almost absorb that pain and overcome it and just keep moving, they always go on to run fantastic times of comrades. And then the rest of us that really don't like that, that like sore muscle pain, we spend a lot of time walking to, to comrades and very seldom hit really the time that we're aiming for. And, and I use the, the word we because personally, I really enjoy the up. I do really well at the up. And on the down run, I'm one of those people where the pain eventually is like, well, I just want to walk from here to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lindsay, I mean, I'm with you on that one. And, and I mean, I've, I've put the, the root profile up there. And and I think that that describes it. I mean, the uprun, like you said, I mean, the first half you're basically just climbing all the way out of Durban, but on, on the down run, that, that second half is bruising. And, and and I mean, I feel exactly the same way about you. I've done done both now, and I much prefer the up, even after the tough conditions we had this year. I'd much rather run the up than the down. So, the down is 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 different in the in the sense that it just hurts a hell of a lot. Whereas the the, the up, if if I'm correct, probably. You, probably need to be a, a stronger runner to, to be better at the up, but the, the down, you've just got to be able to handle pain, and the bigger you are, uh, essentially the worse it is. Yes, but, but surprisingly, there are a lot of big guys that uh, can tolerate that pain, so they still do better on the down run, and there's, there's, I mean, if we look at the times, you will see, you can see that there's about 600 people who get silver, for example, whereas on the up run, uh, it's closer to 400, and, and in fact, this year it was probably closer to 300 with the 
condition. So, yeah, it is faster, but it's definitely more painful. Um, and, yeah, I guess to, to just to touch back on the original question, how do you prepare differently? Well, on the, the up run, I do a lot more strength work in my running. In other words, a lot more um, hill work, um, running up long hills in my long training runs, but also doing short uh, hill repeats on fairly steep hill to, to strengthen my quads and make me strong. And on the down run, I do an entirely different type of, of uh, strengthening, and that would be to spend a bit more time in the gym uh, to, to strengthen our legs against that eccentric loading, and then also to do more speed work, but to do it, in, to do it intelligently. So we do more faster running because that, that really increases the eccentric load, but we don't go berserk and like sprint 400s and, and that sort of thing. Okay, cool. Lindsay, I've got a couple of specific questions coming through on, on the training already uh, with regards to, to what you should be doing as, as far as different types of training, but we'll get into that just now. I think let's touch on, on the basics with regards to where you should be right now if you're thinking about doing this race. And just remember, if you do want to ask any questions, we are active on Twitter right now as well. Just use the hashtag AskR. TSA. You can also pop us uh, a question on our Facebook page. Just go to Run Talk SA, or if you'd like, you can pop me an email as well. Lindsay, as far as as the the, the training goes, where should someone? We, we've put together a little bit of slide, but where should someone be right now as far as their their sort of training? If they're just getting going now, what what they what should they they be doing from here to start building up on? Yeah. So let's split that into answering it in two parts. The first part is let's talk about the people who are who this is a bucket list item, they have done little to no running, um, they've entered now or been goaded into doing it by a friend or, or, or a family member or whatever. So we're talking about the people that are going to be skating it thin and, and what are the minimums. And right now your focus should be on getting going and the the sort of motto that I always go by is the slower your build up, the more sustainable the change and the greater your chance of getting through this without injury. And if you can get through the next three months without an injury, then you are 80% of the way to achieving your goal. So right now, don't go more than four days a week. So I would be running three to four times a week. I'd go 20 to 30 minutes. And the less activity that you are currently doing at this moment, the more of that 20 to 30 minutes should be taken up by walking. So as an example, if you are going from absolute zero to uh, plan hero on the 1st of June, then you should be doing about four minutes of walking to every one minute of running. And every week you can change that. So you go in, in week two, you would then do three minutes of of walking to every two minutes of running and then three minutes of running to every two minutes of walking, so on and so forth. And you slowly build up till in about three months' time, if you can be running between five and ten kilometers, even with a little bit of walking in between that, then you are really starting to get to a point where running a half marathon in January becomes really plausible. Running a marathon in late February, early March becomes plausible and doing comrades in June becomes a possibility. If you are someone who is fairly active, uh, that is currently doing running, um, or you want to do well in comrades, you've done well in half marathons and that sort of thing, then what your aim should be right now is building yourself up to do a marathon in November, December. And the reason why you want to do that is effectively come next year you don't want to be chasing seeding times because the big mistake that a lot of people that are serious about comrades make but especially those people that are real borderline cases for whatever medal it is that they're going for they run a hard marathon somewhere in February and March and then we need to recover from that effort and for us what we want to do is we want to get everyone to the first of March without injury, with nice tough legs, and able to do the major bit of training that's required for comrades. Um, and so, yes, if, if you are running now, then build up to a marathon by all means. If you've ne never run before, 
then we need to be patient and we will only just scratch on doing a marathon and sneaking in those qualifying times, which I'm sure we'll touch on later. Uh, because really, when you get to March, these are sort of your minimum time commitments that you, you're going to look at. You're going to be training between four and six days a week, and that will depend entirely on your performance level. But if you're going in for the finish, your time commitment is really to be doing two to three one-hour runs a week and then one to two runs of being two or between two and four hours a week, depending on, on exactly where we are in that cycle. Okay, Lindsay, a couple, a couple of questions coming through. One just came through from Jill on email. I, I mean, this this sort of training, you, you look at the, the breakdown, and it's, it's, it's quite tough with, with regards to, like, what should you be doing, what shouldn't you be doing. Jill was saying, how many marathons and ultras should we run before comrades? This is her second comrades. She doesn't say if it's her, her first down or if she's done the down before. But I think a lot of people get stuck in that they're not quite sure how many, how many marathons and ultras they should run in the build-up. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm going to assume that she's doing a back-to-back -back just to simplify the answer a little bit. But effectively, your novices, and I consider your novice, anyone who hasn't done an, a, both an up and a down, um, to be a novice. And your novice, again, your minimum requirements is to do one marathon or an ultra. That's your absolute minimum, just from a qualifying perspective. But just from a, a kind of ideal training perspective, one marathon and one ultra is enough for a absolute novice. Then someone going into their second year of comrades that was quite consistent and didn't have any injury problems can look at either doing two marathons and, and one ultra, that's my preference, or doing one marathon and two ultras, which a lot of people feel that they need uh, for the confidence. Then if we move away into your more experienced uh, runner, uh, maybe your third or fourth or fifth comrades, uh, then you can look at doing three marathons and two ultras. But we, we're already starting to get kind of to the extreme there. Uh, and even as a silver medalist, I wouldn't recommend much more than that. Okay. And then, Lindsay, you talk about the different medals. Uh, I'm just going to throw out some questions that we've been getting on, on the social media. This one came in from Ralph Schulz. He says he was training in July. He got flu for three weeks. Got going again last week. He did a nine and a half k in an hour, and then on Sunday did an eight k in. Oh, sorry, today he did an eight k in forty three minutes. What program should he be following during those sort of times? He's keen on on running a bull rowan. Is is that realistic? Look, we're a long way away, so I think running a, a forty three minutes, particularly now that he has had the flu, um, means that he is a possible bull run, but he's never going to be a safe bull run. So he's the kind of guy that I would say, yes, I think the bull run program is an appropriate program, but especially later on in the program, we are adding the, the um, optional extra running day. He's the kind of guy that that run is not necessarily going to be a good thing. He's going to have to see how his body responds. And then as we progress into into January and February, he's going to have to reassess his goals because he's going to have to get a lot closer to like 34 and a half minutes uh, for him to be a really solid uh, candidate for, for a bull run. 36 minutes is probably your real borderline case. So he's a little bit away from that at this moment in time, but we have got a long way to, to go. So by a, a systematic controlled approach, he could get himself close to that 36-minute mark. But like I said, he's going to have to reassess, uh, and he may just be one of those guys who's going to be a 9.30, 9.45 guy, but those guys are still going to be okay training on the Bull Rowan program. Okay, cool. And, and, and just touching on those programs, we'll get to it just now, but all of those programs are up on the Comrades website, comrades.com as well. So uh, if you are looking for a specific training program, that's where you can access them. Got a, a message in on our Facebook page, Lindsay, all the way from Canada, uh, from Mary Kulik. Mott, good day, Mary. Thanks uh, for your message. It said, are there any specific marathons in Canada that can be used to qualify for Comrades? Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong, but any standard marathon is, is, is good as a qualifier? Yeah, so any 42k race or longer, 
um, that has been, where the distance has been um, officially recognized by the local uh, national uh, body, will be accepted as a Comrades qualifier. Uh, and I guess the, the easiest place to look is on the IAAF. There's a whole lot of, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of races that are officially recognized by the IAAF through the various national uh, uh, federations, uh, much the same as the, the way that the Boston uh, Marathon application works, uh, and, and Comrades will recognize any of those. Uh, and co Comrades Marathon will also go as far as if they know there is a place that has a very poor running infrastructure, uh, and if I use a country like uh, Zimbabwe as an example, uh, in Bulawayo, where the guys don't have access to a lot of marathons, the, the, the local running club there organizes a 42.2K, uh, it's almost a training run, um, but it is measured correctly, and, and through um, an arrangement with the Comrades Marathon Association, they will recognize the athletes that are sent through by the chairman of that club. So the easiest way is IAAF, but you know, if you are out there and you live in a, in a place that's kilometers and kilometers from anywhere and you're not going to get access to marathon, there are options available. Okay, Lindsay, let's talk a little bit about those qualifiers. For, for people who aren't sort of, or haven't been around comrades, they, they may not really know what the criteria are are to, to qualify to run Comrades. Uh, sh should we talk through it? Obviously, if you ran Comrades last year and you finished, you don't need, I say last year, I keep on getting mixed up because we're talking about 2014. If you ran Comrades this year in 2013 and uh, you're planning on running next year, you don't have to qualify as long as you did finish. But if you are an out-and-out -out novice and, and you, you are, are planning on running your first Comrades, there are qualifying criteria. Do you want to, you want to talk them through? We've got a slide for that as well. Yeah, Brad, I've got some bad news for you. You are now officially a, a, a comrades uh, addict. You'll run every year for the rest of your life. You now <laughs> take the year from the, the current comrades to the previous comrades. And now that comrades' entries have opened, you talk in terms of last year, last year's comrades, and this year the comrades on the way. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> Look, <laughs> the, the, the easiest number to remember always is that the the standard marathon, 42.2 k's or 26 miles um, for the Americans out there, um, sub five. So that's the most commonly used qualifying time. And then as you go through the list there, you've got 48 to 50, 52 to 54. Now, those two, because there's a range, obviously if you can find yourself a 52 kilometer or 48 k, uh, that becomes the easiest uh, Time-wise, I mean, obviously it's further, so it's not necessarily the easiest uh, to run. And then um, some of the other popular distances in races in South Africa, 56, 60, 64, uh, so so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, those are the qualifying times. Um, and as I said, the most commonly used one is the 42.2, and you need to do that under five hours to book your place on the start line at Comrades. Okay, and just staying on, on the qualifying side of things, Lindsay, I just got an email in from Stuart MacArthur, and, and he was saying that uh, his daughter and himself failed to qualify on two attempts this year and still battled to get their pace at qualifying level. Have you got any advice for someone who really struggles to qualify? Look, I, th I think in their case, um, a few specific details would be useful. Uh, you know, we, we need to see if they are converting their 10k time into a 21k time um, and if they are doing that, how does that 21k time convert into a marathon? Because once we have that information, we can start then looking at the marathon itself. So if they are fine at 21k um, but something else is going wrong, then we can look to training and see if there's something that we can correct in the training and the way they're doing the long runs or perhaps how long the long runs are. Um, and if we look at the training and see, but hang on, it's not a training effect, then there may be an issue in the pacing. And, and unfortunately, the, the nature of the races that we are training for is that the longer the race gets, the more severely pacing strategy is punished. Um, and so it may, you know, it, it could be something as simple as forcing them to take more walk breaks in the first 20 k's means that they're fresh enough to get through the second half of the marathon. Um, 
But yeah, firstly, the first point of call is always, if you can run 8K as an X amount of time, you should be able to do half marathon in this time. Are you getting that right? Um, are you faster in the slightly longer relative to the shorter? Um, and then we start analyzing and breaking it down. So look, at the moment, um, the, the Comrades forums are not up, but they will be. The new website is excellent, um, and they're still working some of the things. So that's the kind of person I would strongly encourage to get in touch with me on the forum uh, so that we can have a more de detailed back and forth and we can get him to his qualifier. Okay, yeah. and, and, I, and I mean, in my experience, Lindsay, I mean, my first comrades, for, for people who don't know my sort of background, I, I scraped in on my qualifier. I think I ran a 457, and, and I ended up missing missing a cutoff in that first year. And, and the truth of the matter is, the reason those qualifiers are there is if, I mean, if you want to call a spade a spade, if you're battling to run a marathon under five hours, you're going to battle to finish comrades. So you, you, you want to, to, to sort of get that thing qualified comfortably so that it's not a, a real massive stretch on comrades race day because it is a, a big step up from there. And then, Lindsay, sorry, I, I just got a follow-up on that question from Mary uh, in Canada. She was saying, so Boston Marathon, would that be a qualifier? I, I'm presuming that would definitely be a qualifier for comrades. If, look, unless you're in the charity batch, um, if you are at Boston, you have qualified for comrades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, okay. Mary, hopefully that, hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, Lindsay also got a question in from Dubai, from Damien uh, Tin Bomber. Damien, thanks for joining us today. Uh, he was saying, obviously, Dubai is pretty flat. Is hill training a prerequisite for doing comrades? Look, it's it's really, it's strongly advised. It's obviously not something that you need to finish the race. You can do all your training on flat roads. Uh, you will finish comrades, but there's absolutely no way that you will reach your true potential on race day. The 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 hills on comrades are perhaps by by European and and, and American standards, the hills are not enormous in that they aren't steep. I mean, we're talking three. Two to three percent gradient, but they are four kilometers and six kilometers and seven kilometers and two and a half kilometers and three kilometers. It's it's on and on and on. I mean, if if you if you're joining us from a an international uh, or you, you're coming over an international, it's an amazing race with an amazing atmosphere. In fact, I liken it to Boston. They are, they are comrades in Boston are two favorite races in, in the whole world but from an atmosphere point of view. Very similar. Similar history, rich tradition, but man, when you run it, you will wonder what kind of lunatic decided to put an 89-kilometer foot race over this terrain. So, um, if you live in a particularly flat place, then I strongly encourage you to do some form of, of formal hill training, either on a, a treadmill. And I know that all the guys who train for comrades in Dubai. They drive out, is it Jamal? I, I, I'm guessing a little bit on the name. I think something with a J. But there is a run that you can do up over, down the other side, run a bit, come back up over. And it's currently a decent enough climb so you can get in some uh, hill training. But no, you've, 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 I can't recommend it strongly enough that you've got to do some uh, hill training for this race. Yeah, the, the hills are, are frightening to say the least. So uh, keep those questions coming. If you are on uh, Twitter, you can send it via the hashtag AskRTSA. Lots of questions coming through on there. We'll get to some of those in a moment. You can also pop them to us on our Facebook page, Run Talk SA. Or if you'd like, you can pop me an email, podcast at Run Talk SA. That is uh, the email address to send them to. Uh, Lindsay, one of the things I wanted to ask as well, and, and it's coming through on 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 the, the the Twitter feed. A couple of people are asking with regards to taking a bit of a break, especially guys who have run comrades last year, going for their back to back. A couple of them are saying they've trained all the way through. Should they take a bit of a break before they they start building up again, sort of heading towards comrades 2014? Look, if they took absolutely no break after comrades, which would be surprising, um, I know that you're not nearly as sore after the up run. It's a two to three day limp instead of a, a five to six day limp, as Bruce Wallace always likes to tell us. Um, but they should have taken some kind of, of break, even if it was only two weeks after comrades. So 
assuming that they did that as a minimum, I, if I'm those guys, I'm going to build myself up to a marathon in either October, November, or early December. And whenever I do that marathon, I would take a three-week break. Now, that doesn't mean that, I'm, that I necessarily have to do absolutely no running for three weeks, but I would try and push it to two weeks where I do absolutely absolutely no running and then the third week maybe just a little bit of this and that. Um, if you are one of those people that just really can't go without exercise then I would at least encourage you to do some cycling or or something, some slightly different exercise for three weeks uh, and then plan to be kind of getting back into the swing of training through December, um, get yourself to January in a, in a good uh, headspace, fresh uh, and then from January through to February, you, you lay yourself a really solid foundation so that uh, March, April, and early May, you can really put in the hard yards. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, there was one question that came through, Lindsay, from, from someone who was saying they've been training quite hard since comrades, they, they're going to run the Berlin Marathon uh, later this month. Should they take some time off after Berlin? Yeah, look, I would. Um, Look, I don't know a lot of people have done that com combination, but most of the people that I've that I've spoken to uh, have had slightly disappointing uh, Berlin's because because comrades takes a lot out of you and you've got to do a lot of hard training. But um, yeah, I would that the people that are running Berlin, hopefully their training's gone well. They have a really good race, so that it's a, a positive experience because it's really nice to take a bit of a breather after a positive experience. But even if it's not. Yeah, I would go for two weeks, um, you know, just take a bit of time off, and then for the rest of the year, to either focus on, on working on your speed for the kind of really short stuff, or just to, to kind of have one of those sort of ticking over three to four times a week, possibly a bit of uh, other cross training, um, so that, again, those people can get to December um, and, and really crack on for six months of, of committed training. Okay, and, and Lindsay, just sticking with, with the training, I, I got a tweet in from uh, Roger Heller. Uh, just talking on that hill training still again for, for the down run. He says, can you substitute hill training for gym work? Look, I wouldn't substitute hill training for gym work um, unless you absolutely cannot get any hill access to hill training. In other words, no treadmill. But, I mean, if you're going to get in the gym, there's a treadmill. But I would strongly encourage that they that they do some some uh, strength work too. For the down run, I always tell people, rather than, if you're running four times a week, rather than making time to run an extra time in the week, rather make time to get in the gym and do some single leg squats, but a leg press, lunges, the sort of things that are step ups onto a high step, the sort of things that are gonna fortify your quads against the hammering of uh, field hill. Yeah, and that, that hammering <laughs> is, a, is a proper hammering. Uh, Lindsay, I got a tweet in from Dylan Young as well. I know Dylan's in the States. Uh, and he was saying that he ran a marathon on the 2nd of June this year. Does that count as a qualifier for Comrades? I mean, that's the same day as Comrades was this year. Does, does that count, or did they start counting from the day after Comrades? But they, they, strictly speaking, they count from the day after Comrades. However, that is one um, that I would jump onto the website get hold of uh, Comrades Marathon, I think I think they may let that one through. Um, but yeah, if, if, the, if you read the official rule, it's basically any marathon between the two races. So um, yeah, in the West, are they ahead or behind? Sorry, I'm... I'm They're behind us. Ahead. Yeah, so, so in, in uh, theory, he actually ran the marathon after we ran Comrades, so perhaps... <laughs> Now you're getting very technical. Lindsay, I mean, we, we, we named this this webinar Is Comrades for Me? And and got a, got a tweet in from Hetty, and she said, how do I know if Comrades is for me? Well, the first thing is, if you've... Look, I don't know if you've watched Comrades or if you've grown up, but I, I think for a start, if you've ever watched Comrades and watched the people finishing the race and thought, man, I, I wish I could do that one day, then I think Comrades is for you. Because I think, I think the, the kind of special thing about Comrades, I mean, we've, I tend to maybe overemphasize how difficult 
comrades is because I really want people to know what they're getting themselves in for. But I think the, the, the real special, unique feature about the comrades is it doesn't matter whether you first or last. You have done something incredible. You've gone 89 kilometers, and even on the down run, you've gone over some pretty big climbs. You've withstood a, a, a fair degree of, of physical uh, discomfort. You've managed your body. You've managed your mind. Um, and it's really that day that anybody who lines up has got the potential to do something. And when they cross that finish line, to really feel so, so super proud of themselves. Um, and I honestly believe that people who go or get across that, that finishing line ultimately have taken a big step into that realm of anything is possible when I put my, my mind to it. Um, and a couple of, of years ago, um, one of the, the sort of um, um, advertising lines or, or whatever was, it's, it's that one day where the ordinary person has got something, uh, has got an opportunity to do something extraordinary. And I think that really sums it up. So, um, yeah, if you've ever watched that race and thought, Phew, I would... I wish I was one of those people, then, then comrades is for you. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Lindsay. I mean, so many people sit and watch watch comrades every year and, and just wish it was them. And and truthfully, you, you're far enough away from the race now that if you if you make that decision and you really commit to it, uh, you can get there for for, uh, for June next year. Uh, another question through on, on our Twitter Twitter handle, and I'm just going to share those details once again. If you do have any questions that you'd like to uh, get asked on this webinar, we uh, are taking questions live on Twitter. All you have to do is use the hashtag AskRTSA. You can also Facebook it to us. Uh, just get onto our Facebook page, Run Talk SA, or you can uh, pop it onto email. That's the email address there, podcast at Run Talk SA as well. So it is that easy to, to be in touch. Uh, Lindsay, I don't want to get into too much sort of really nitty gritty training stuff because, I, I mean, as we go and get closer to race day, the plan is through more and more of these things and, and, and hopefully then get into a bit more sort of detail with, with regards to training. But Marika Duplessis was asking that she heard the longest training run you need to do is somewhere around 65 Ks. How does this work and is this long enough? And let me let me just state, I mean, I've run or well, finished three comrades now. I've never run a training run that long. I mean, I the longest I go, I think the longest I've ever been before comrades is a 50. So uh, I'm going to throw that question to you. Yeah, look, she's going to be just fine if, she, if she's... Uh already thinking that a training run run of 65 is not long enough. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's, I think to answer that question without overcomplicating it, a lot of the advice of training for comrades comes from the, the people that were kind of considered the gurus in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. And through the early 80s, the race really boomed. And in the 80s, when it was booming, the people were getting advice from, from the guys that were finishing in the late 70s and early 80s. And to give you an idea, in the early 80s, there were just under 2,000 people that were finishing comrades. And in, in that period, there were more people getting silver medals in a 2,000 field than there were now when the fields are 14 to 16,000. So really what I'm saying is that the percentage of runners that ran comrades through the 70s and, and early 80s were all very good runners. Um, and so a lot of the training advice filtered through from them. And for these guys, they firmly believed in a 60 to 70 kilometer training run, run four weeks before comrades. Now that's fine for somebody who is more genetically and biomechanically primed for running. They recover much faster from that sort of effort. Um, whereas your, your kind of eight, from eight hour finisher all the way through to your 12 hour guy, as you go, go further back, one of the, the key differentiators between how well they run is their biomechanics and their ability to recover from training. So hopefully I haven't overcomplicated the answer, but the reality for me is that I 
wants people to run far enough that they understand that it's not really possible to do this race without having some kind of discomfort, but also to realize in that moment that they can actually run with a fair degree of success, even though they are quite uncomfortable. And for me, that point comes somewhere around the 40 to 55 kilometer mark, um, 45 to 55 kilometer mark. And just so that everybody knows that my personal best comrades was off the longest training run of 45 kilometers. Um, but I have done 56 Ks, I've done 60 Ks. I, I really love Two Oceans, which is another one of our, our local races, which will be in April this year, which is a little close to comrades, but it's still not a it's still a decent option as a long training run. So no, sixty for me for a novice. 60 kilometers is too far. It takes novices too long to recover from that effort, and I think most of them are still suffering from the effects of that during the race. So I would angle for 50 kilometers, um, maximum 55. I really feel like you need the psychological boost of those extra 5Ks. And as a novice, I would peg that between 6 and 5 weeks from race day. 6 being my favorite number for novices but five weeks for absolute later so that you can give yourself a good three weeks for that run to get out of your system and then we obviously taper right down to, to race day. All right, cool. And then, Lindsay, a couple of questions coming in on, on pacing on, on race day itself. And, and, and one in particular came in from, from Roger Heller. And he said, what would be a good race day strategy? Would it be to conserve or gain ground at the beginning so that you've got in the bag for later. You, you, we've had this conversation many times, and, and you, you sort of, there's a, a pretty cool analogy that you, you, I don't know if you want to get into that. Look, for me, it's all about pacing yourself correctly on race day. Now, there's a, there's a huge debate versus time in the bag versus, you know, my, my, my feeling is, is simple. Okay. We've been doing this race now for, this will be the 89th running of the Comrades Marathon, and people will always throw stats in my face and say that everybody runs slow in the second half of the race. And I'm like, yo, guys, but that's because we keep running the race the same way. And if you run the race too fast, you've got, there is no other option but to explode and slow down in the, in the second half of the race. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The problem I think that is difficult to wrap your, your mind around is that when you start comrades, when we look at the various medals, we've got five minutes a K for a silver, six minutes a K for a bull roan, seven minutes a K for a bronze, eight minutes a K to finish the race. When we start running, and I'm a silver medal contender as an example, I can run a marathon at a 415 or faster per kilometer. So five minutes per K feels really, really slow. So at the beginning, four and a half minutes a K feels really, really easy. But the problem is the cumulative effect of that four and a half Ks or four and a half minute Ks, eventually by 60 Ks, you can't even go at six and a half, seven minutes a K. You can't run anymore. Um, so, so the strategy really should be as conservative as possible. I have sort of settled on on giving people between, depending on the medal, but somewhere in the region of three to seven minutes. Buffer, if you want to call it that. But for me, it's not really a buffer. Because if you can get your second half to within five minutes of your, of your first half, you've run an outstandingly paced race of comrades. Now, I don't know if you can flick that, uh, that slide up, which highlights the, the, um, uh, the profile. But if you flick that up, you will see that, that the second half of Comrades is almost exclusively downhill, particularly from the 39K mark. So the, 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 if you look at Drum in the halfway cutoff, it's not an entirely accurate reflection because from um, Drummond to where you'll see there the top of both is hill, that is a, a tough climb. Make no mistake, that is a really tough climb. But literally from the top of both is hill all the way until you get to that little pine town on the, on the map. That is all a lot of downhill. Cowie's Hill is then about 2.7 kilometers. 
but from the top of Cowies all the way through um, what's called Westville to just before you hit Durban boundary, uh, where you'll run over 45th cutting, which is also about two kilometers. That is all down here. So if we just look at the profile, and even accounting for the effects of fatigue, because eventually, yes, we are going to slow down and struggle to run. But because of the nature of the second half of the down run, if we've done it right, we should run very close to what we run in the first half. But it's like it magnifies disproportionately. I mean, if you run a, a, a five-kilometer race and you explode at the 3K mark, and you are on track to run a 20 minutes, you'll probably still be able to crawl home in 21 or 21 and a half. It doesn't seem like you missed your goal by that much. If you blow up in a, in a 21K race and, and you blow up at the 15K mark and you limp home in the last six minutes, you may be five to, to six minutes off your goal time. Also, it doesn't seem like a hell of a lot. But when you blow up in Comrade at the 60K mark, okay, 60K mark, you still have have 29 kilometers to go, okay? That's almost 20 miles. And to drag yourself over that distance is very, very mentally difficult and physically difficult. So your time just starts to balloon. You suddenly lost half an hour, suddenly lost an hour. You're suddenly in danger of not finishing the race. Um, so conservative, I've, I've, I've really emphasize this because I feel particularly strongly that a lot of people fail at comrades because their pacing strategy sucks. Okay, yeah. Lindsay, I mean, I, <laughs> I think about my last down run and, and it was exactly that. Coming down Fields Hill I was hating myself, but at least gravity's on your side on the down run. You don't have to drag your backside up the hill. You can just let gravity do what it does on the way down. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left of this webinar. Don't forget, if you want to be in touch, uh, you can pop us an email, podcast at RunTalkSA. You can also get onto our Facebook page and just uh, leave us a message there. It is uh, facebook.com forward slash RunTalkSA. Or if you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag AskRTSA. Uh, got another one, and this is quite an interesting question, Lindsay, because I think this freaks out a lot of novices who have, have perhaps run a marathon and think, boy, I'm knackered after a marathon, and now you want me to go do double that and a little bit more. And the question comes from John uh, Cleophas. Hopefully I got the pronunciation of that surname right. It says he's done two marathons and was broken at the end of both of them. Should I comfortably finish a marathon before trying comrades? Uh, look, not... No, you don't necessarily have to finish a marathon comfortably uh, because, I mean, a lot of people are broken at the end of the marathon because they've been chasing a time. I suppose where you have a, a little bit of a problem is if you've broken running a, a 4.59, then perhaps you want to consider your options for comrades. But there are two, there are two interesting things that happen between finishing com your, your first marathon or a qualifier and comrades, because even experienced runners, when they do their first marathon of the comrades training season, they always have that thought, Yo, I don't know if I'm going to be ready to do that again with a little bit more tagged on the end. Okay, So the two things that happen is that the, the, the cumulative effect of your training makes you a lot stronger and makes you a little more positive. Then when you run the 50k, when you go through the marathon mark, you'll be like, hey, man, I don't feel so bad. But as you're nearing the 50 or if you, you know, go on to 55, you start to think, you know, okay, this is, is, is really bad. And then the gearing in your mind shifts. So when we start at 42, our mind is all about the 42. And as we get to the culmination of that 42, we feel pretty spent. Yet when we move then to a two oceans, as an example, then the gearing is already switched so that when we get through the marathon mark, we don't feel so bad. And part of that is training, and part of that is just that you mentally give yourself, today I'm running 56 Ks. And when you line up at the start of Comrades, it's absolutely no difference. You are you petrified, particularly if you haven't run Comrades before, but the reality is that you've done a whole lot of training, a lot of people have told you you're going to be okay, and 
and you just gear your mind towards 89k so that when you go through halfway 44ks you're like jeez man I can't believe how good I feel sure you get to 50ks and you start to feel a bit drained and fatigued but you still know hey man I can do this thing and, and the next thing you know and it's a little bit cruel at the start of the race because comrades counts down you know you get to the first sign and it says 88k to go the second sign 87k to go but once you cross the 50k point, that actually becomes highly motivational because you get 39k to go, and then 10k later, it's 29k to go, and then all of a sudden you get into double digits, and you're like, "Whoa, I've only, I've only got 19k to go." And it's all about the psychological gearing and the cumulative effect of all the training that you've done. So, yeah, even if you were spent after your after your marathon. Do yourself a favor, get yourself to a 50k uh, race, and you will be amazed at, at. You may still be spent at the 50, but you're not going to be spent at the 42k mark. Yeah, it's definitely definitely a psychological thing. And then, Lindsay, we've got quite a few people watching this webinar and, and interacting from from overseas, and and got a pretty interesting question from from someone in the states, uh, Street Talk on Twitter at Street Talk 66. Yeah. Uh, we're saying international runner from the U.S. Is it a prerequisite or is it a requirement rather to stay at a hotel in Durban near the finish or in a hotel near in Peter Maritzburg for the start? Does it make such a big difference or can you stay in one hotel and, and travel to and from? So you can stay in one hotel and travel to and from. So because this year is a down run and you, you're starting in Peter Maritzburg, there is a bus service which will take you from uh, Durban to the finish to the start. I um, I normally have a, ho a hotel in Durban that I will stay at and then either um, stay at a and b or, or at a, or I'm quite happy to stay at one of the hostels but um, when, my, when my wife's on the trip we stay in a and b because I like to be close to the start. Um, otherwise it's a very early start. I think the buses leave at half past 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, so yeah, if, if you're coming from overseas, from a logistical point of view, it's probably much easier to just have your hotel um, in one place. And if I if if I have to choose where to be, and I only have can be at one place, I would choose to be at the finish. Um, it is so difficult to find the buses to get yourself back to the start. If that's where you're staying, it becomes a really late night. You. You are uncomfortable, elated, but you are uncomfortable. So it's much nicer um, if you can have your hotel close to the finish, go there and uh, throw yourself on the bed and start earning your, your rest. Or you've earned your rest, you know what I'm going to say. And, and not do what I did this year and, and literally flew back the same night. So finished the race, headed straight to the airport, hopped on a plane and got to sleep in my own bed that night. Yeah, look, at, at least when the, when the chips were really down and you thought you, oh, I think I'll walk now, you're like, oh, can't afford to, you've got to catch a plane. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather, rather fly back to Joburg than walk, especially after running Comrades. It's, it's a lot less a lot more comfortable. Lindsay, got a, got a question in from Oscar Carl Benjamin on our Facebook page as well. And, and this is quite an interesting one because this, this is someone who, who started running in July 2012. So it was less than a year after Comrades 2012. Uh, oh, yeah, and and he started running then 7th of July 2012. Since then, he's run Omdi Dum, which is uh, for for people who don't know, is a 50 50k ultra marathon. He's run Two Oceans, which is a 56k ultra marathon, and he ran Comrades last year. He hasn't stopped training. He reckons uh, he's running between 50 and 60k's a week now. Is he guaranteed he's back to back next year? Unless he breaks down with injury, yes. So I think I think. There, much like the saying goes in cycling, there's only two kinds of cyclists, those that have fallen off their bike and those that are going to fall off their bike. Running is the same. I mean, you get two types of runners, those that have been injured and those that are going to be injured. It's a, it's a part of our sport. We, we try to minimize the impact of injury. Um, but because he's trained all the way through, it's inevitable that at some point in time there's going to be a breakdown. And look, I would I would encourage him to to preempt that again. 
Um, he's had a pretty good run now, so uh, you know, and he's already he's on 50 to 60 k's a week now. So to to pick that up just a little bit uh, for a decent marathon in early October, and then I would encourage him to have a two to three week break, uh, and then to get himself cracking for comrades. But yeah, I would say that he is almost a shoe in for comrades unless something uh, happens a long-term chronic injury or, or something like that. But he's really got, he's starting to build up quite a nice running CV, so he shouldn't have any problems. Okay, I just, just got a tweet in as well, uh, a follow-up to that hotel question, whether you should book a hotel room in Peter Maritzburg before the start. This uh, here's a bit of an early warning. I haven't actually checked the dates, but someone obviously has. Uh, Roger Heller says, book your hotel early. The Mountain Bike World Cup is in Peter Maritzburg at the same time as Comrades next year. Well, look, that we must actually look at the calendar because that means that someone in the, the municipality made a, a bit of a balls up because that's um, yeah, 19,000 runners descending on uh, Durban and Maritzburg with families and a, a good portion of those like to wake up in Maritzburg because it literally gives you an extra two to two and a half hours of sleep uh, extra. Um, yeah, thanks for that heads up. I've, I know that my mates that I run Commerce with have already booked the, the B&B in Peter Maritzburg. Um, yeah, I suggest the rest of you do the same. Yeah, I, I know. I know what I'm doing when we hang up from this this webinar. I'm gonna go find a hotel room. <laughs> Lindsay, yeah, geez, I'm just looking at the time. That's that's about it. Unfortunately, I think we we are just about out of time. Uh, out of time. Uh, yeah, just a, a heads up. We are planning on doing more of these things as well in the build up to Comrades 2014. Hopefully, once a month. That's the the plan. And and we'll then get into more nitty gritty sort of training wise, especially sort of where you should be now. Uh, looking ahead the next month, what you should be doing, just to sort of help you along the way. And and it's the first time we're doing something like this for comrades. I'm pretty excited about it. It's a great way for us to get into into people's living rooms and, and homes, uh, not just in South Africa but around the world. It's the first time that that race like comrades has done something like this. So uh, yeah, hopefully hopefully we can get more and more people on board. And 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 then just to end off, Lindsay, as as far as training programs go, you you're the official comrades coach. You write the programs. We're going to have some programs on runtalksa.co.za as well, but all of the programs are on, on comrades.com as well. Yeah, correct. So, so those uh, programs are on comrades.com as we speak. Um, and, yeah, we will be chatting in the next uh, 24 hours. Um, now that we've got a bit of interest going, uh, yeah, as I, as I have already agreed to do, we will get some, run tour, some programs up on Run Talk SA. Which will be a little more focused on the the beginner or novice uh, than the ones on the on the comrades website. Cool, Lindsay. Yeah, there's the details there. Those are the two websites: comrades.com, uh, Run Talk SA. Also, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, Lindsay's available as well and, and pretty active. So if you've got any questions, you can pop a question off to Lindsay. It's Lindsay Parry ZA. I'm on there as well, Big Brad Brown. And then, as always, Comrades is, is just super efficient on, on the social media. They're on Twitter as well, Comrades Race. You can also get hold of them through their Facebook page, and they are always on there. So if you have any questions or any queries, uh, just get in touch with the folks at Comrades. And then, as always, as well, you can get hold of us at Run Talk SA as well. If you don't know what Run Talk SA is, it is a weekly podcast that's focused on the South African running scene, but we've got quite a big listenership overseas as well. We talk pretty much everything that happens here in SA. And from here on in, there'll be a lot of comrades talk as well. So if you'd like to check it out, just go over to that website, runtalksa.co.za. Lindsay, uh, thank you very much for your time tonight. We really do appreciate it. Uh, it's, I think for, for a first attempt, it was it was pretty cool, and, and I look forward to do, doing another one of you. Yeah, no, this was uh, great. I had a had a really good time. Can't believe the hour went by so quickly, um, and I really do look forward to the next one. Awesome. Yeah. So from Lindsay Perry and myself, Brad Brown, uh, all the best with your training. Stay injury free, and and yeah, watch the space. Keep tuning in to to Run Talk SA, and we'll let you know when the next one is happening. So until then, take care. Cheers.